Hello, how is everyone doing? It is your fallen angel back with another video. Today, we are going over a brief history of mathematical thought, human cognition, and the meaning of math. So without further ado, let us begin. The literature of mathematics is largely composed of arguments of the form, if A and B are true, then it follows that C is also true. We can also think of Pythagorean theorem when we think of this the same model that Pythagoras created for the triangles. And it is worth pausing to wonder how it is that humans developed the capacity for deductive reasoning. We are not the only animals who are alert to the range of possible consequences of our actions, and we might suppose that our grasp of logical consequences is only possible because we have evolved the cognitive abilities needed to predict the practical consequences of the things that we might do. For example, imagine a hungry ape looking at another ape with some food. It might think to itself, if I grab the food, that big guy will hit me. I don't want to be hit, so therefore, I should restrain myself and not grab the food. The fact that we use language fundamental, fundamentally changes the character of our reasoning, but it is easy to believe that imagining the consequences of potential actions is an ancient ability that confers as an evolutionary advantage. However, it is hard to see how the evolution of this kind of reasoning about actions and their consequences could enable abstract thought. After all, the scenario I have described is all about judging the way to behave in a complex context, where any new information might change our prediction of what will happen next, and we ought to be open to noticing further clues. For example, if our ape saw the other ape making a friendly gesture, it might be wise to grab the food instead of letting it go. That is very different from working out logical consequences, where one thing follows another. Regardless of any further information that could plausibly come our way, because the social cunning of animals depends on their grasp of entire context, where there are always further clues. It is difficult to see how that kind of understanding could provide the cognitive abilities that a mathematician requires. In contrast, our capacity for spatial reasoning is much less open-ended, and human beings do not need to be trained to make valid spatial deductions. For example, Suppose that there is a jar inside my fridge. Now suppose that there is an olive inside the jar. Is the olive inside the fridge? The answer is yes. Of course the olive is inside the fridge because the olive is in the jar and the jar is in the fridge. Therefore, using deductive reasoning, it is also in the fridge. Now imagine that the jar is in the fridge but the olive is not in the fridge. Is the olive in the jar? Of course not because the jar is in the fridge. And I have just told you that the olive is not in the fridge. In reasoning about the location of the olive, it is sufficient to bear a thin skeleton of facts in mind. Additional information will not change our thinking unless it contradicts the facts that form the basis of our deduction. Also note that in order to make these deductions, we do not need to be initiated into some or another method of symbolizing. All humans can reason in this way, so it is plausible to claim that there are innate neural mechanisms that underpin our grasp of the logical containers. Of course, in order to pose these questions, I need to use some words, but humans and other animals find it very easy to understand that containers have an inside and an outside. And this kind of understanding provides a structure to our perceptual world. There is strong empirical evidence that before they learn to speak, and long before they learn mathematics, children start to structure their perceptual world. For example, a child might play with some eggs by putting them in a bowl, and they have some sense that this is a collection of eggs, is a different spatial region to the things that are outside the bowl. This kind of spatial understanding is a basic cognitive ability, and we do not need symbols to begin to appreciate the sense that we can make of moving something into or out of a container. Furthermore, we can see in an instant the difference between collections containing one, two, three, or four eggs. 
These cognitive capacities enable us to see that when we add an egg to our bowl, moving it from the outside to the inside, the collection somehow changes. And likewise, taking an egg out of the bowl changes the collection. So guys, we also recognize that the human mind is such a cognitive super tool. Everything we see and do is affecting our cognition. Everything we're viewing, seeing, hearing, tasting, everything is affecting our cognition always. Even when we have a bowl of sugar, where we cannot see how many grains there, there might be, small children have some kind of understanding of the process of adding sugar to the bowl or taking some sugar away. That is to say, we can recognize particular acts of adding sugar to a bowl as being examples of someone adding something to a bowl. So the word adding has some grounding in physical experience. Of course, adding sugar to my cup of tea is not an example of mathematical addition. My point is that our innate cognitive capabilities provide a foundation for our notions of containers, of collection of things, and of adding and taking away from those collections. Furthermore, when we teach the more sophisticated, abstract concepts of addition and subtraction, which are certainly not innate, we do so by referring to these more basic, physically grounded forms of understanding. When we use pen and paper to do sums, we do not literally add objects to a collection, but it is no coincidence that we use the same words for both mathematical addition and the physical case where we literally move some objects. After all, even the most greatest of mathematicians first understood mathematical addition by hearing things like, if you have two apples in a basket and you add three more, how many do you have? As the cognitive scientists George Lakoff and Rafael Nunez argue in their thought-provoking and controversial book, Where Mathematics Comes From, our understanding of mathematical symbols is rooted in our cognitive capabilities. In particular, we have some innate understanding of spatial relations, and we have the ability to construct conceptual metaphors, where we understand an idea or conceptual domain by employing the language and patterns of thoughts that were first developed in some other domain. The use of conceptual metaphor is something that is common to all forms of understanding, and as such, it is not characteristic of mathematics in particular. That is simple to say. I take it for granted that new ideas do not ascend from on high. They must relate to what we already know. As physically embodied human beings, and we explain new concepts by talking about how they are akin to some other familiar concept. So when you teach someone something, it's essential that you try to relate it to something that they know right you try to relate it whether this be science math history they try to relate things to a familiarity they try to teach you something that is something you already recognize this is how you learn easier because you could recognize this this is th thought provoking and it creates more of a sense of familiarity when you know to teach things that are akin to another concept conceptual mappings from one thing to another are fundamental to human understanding not least because they allow us to reason about unfamiliar or abstract things by using the inferential structure of things that are deeply familiar. For example, when we are asked to think about adding the numbers 2 and 3, we know that this operation is like adding 3 apples to a basket that already contains 2 apples, and it is also like taking 2 steps followed by the 3 steps. Of course, whether we are imagining moving apples into a basket or thinking about an abstract form of addition, we don't actually need to move any objects. Furthermore, we understand that the touch and smell of apples are not part of the facts of addition, as the concepts involved are very general and can be applied to all manners of situations. Nevertheless, we understand that when we are adding two numbers, the meaning of the symbols entitles us to think in terms of concrete physical cases, though we are not obliged to do so. Indeed, it may well be true to say that our minds and brains are capable of forming abstract number of concepts because we are capable of thinking about particular, concrete, cases. Mathematical reasoning involves rules and definitions, and the fact that computers can add correctly demonstrate that you don't even need to have a brain to correctly employ a specific notational system. In other words, in a very limited way, we can do mathematics without needing to reflect on the significance or meaning of our symbols. However, mathematics isn't only the proper 
rule governed use of symbols. It is about the ideas that can be expressed by the rule governed use of symbols. And it seems that many mathematical ideas are deeply rooted in the structure of the world that we perceive. With that being said, guys, this has been a brief history of the mathematical thought, human cognition, and the meaning of math. We will continue the series on the brief history of mathematical thought later, so feel free to like and subscribe, leave a comment down below, check us out on Patreon, Rumble, Twitter, Instagram, things of that nature. This has been your Fallen Angel, and I am out.